Hello, and welcome to another edition of Law Technology Now. My name is Dan Rodriguez, and I'll be the host for today's show. I'm delighted to welcome uh, my colleague and friend, Professor Jim Spetta, who is the interim dean and a professor at Northwestern University Pritzker School of Law. He's going to talk to us today about the Facebook lawsuit and uh, in big tech and legal regulation, he's exactly the right person to talk about it, being an expert in, among other areas, administrative law, telecommunications, and I know has followed this remarkable uh, story, uh, evolving story of the Facebook litigation uh, closely. Before we get into our show today, I want to take a minute to thank our sponsors. Thanks first to our sponsor, Acumas, patent and trademark renewal payments made easy. Find out how Acumas.com can take the stress out of annuities and save you money on European patent validations today. Thanks also to our sponsor, Logical, instant discovery software for modern legal teams. Logical offers perfectly predictable pricing at just $250 per matter per month. Create your free account anytime at logical.com. That's logic with a K, C-U-L-L dot com forward slash L-T-N. Before I get into a, uh, my conversation with Jim, I actually want to want to start by reporting to our listeners uh, some sad news, uh, and that is the passing earlier uh, this morning of uh, of my friend and our friend Paul Littlewood. Uh, when we were scheduling uh, uh, recordings for this month, I uh, we had scheduled Legal Talk Network had scheduled a, a conversation with Paula, who has been a guest had been a guest on this show before, and and I'll simply say that many of uh, of us who work on legal innovation and reform and legal services, knew of Paula's tremendous uh, work and her courage and her passion on behalf of access to justice. She had worked as the executive director at the Washington State Bar. And for many, and, and I had the privilege to serve with her on the Commission on the Future of Legal Services and also on the Board of Responsive Law. It's, it's a sad passing. I'm sorry that we, we didn't get to do this last recording. And I just know that she'll be very much missed by all of us and our listeners. So, Jim, Facebook, the Facebook litigation. Well, were you surprised when you heard the news? We'll talk about the details, but but uh, those of us who are not aficionados of this area of law woke up that morning and said, "Oh my God, where did this come from? Was this was this uh, lawsuit by the states and by the federal government a surprise?" I think it was a surprise that it happened when it happened. That is to say, so late in the Trump administration. Now, it was somewhat less of a surprise given the lawsuit filed just a few weeks earlier by the Department of Justice against Google on very similar antitrust grounds. So the timing, yes, but there have been ongoing antitrust investigations of Facebook for a number of years. And so the fact that a lawsuit was filed at some point in time, that itself wasn't a surprise. So let's 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 get immediate, immediately in the weeds on this, just so so. And I'm going to recollect without too much PTSD my time uh, studying antitrust law back in back in law school. So so uh, fair warning, I may get this all wrong. But Department of Justice brings a lawsuit against uh, Google under the Sherman Act, I, I gather, which uh, prohibits uh, restraints of trade of various uh, kinds and monopoly. But uh, this is not a lawsuit brought by the Department of Justice. This means the Facebook suit, right? This is a lawsuit, as I understand it, brought by two parties, the, the states and the attorneys general. We'll talk about that. But by the Federal Trade Commission, uh, bringing that claim under the Fed- Federal Trade Commission Act. Do I have that right? You have that exactly right. The Federal Trade Commission does have largely parallel authority to enforce the antitrust laws, although they're bringing the suit under their own organic statute, the Federal Trade Commission Act, but they have largely parallel authority with the Department of Justice to enforce the antitrust laws. And in fact, the Federal Trade Commission was created in 1914 because at the time, Congress was somewhat dissatisfied with the Department of Justice's antitrust enforcement. And so we have essentially two different agencies in the United States government that that enforce the antitrust laws. Now, I mean, I'm a little glib in in putting it this way, but it's not like they've divided the world between one aspect of big tech, Facebook, and and another, Google, and said, hey, Department of Justice, you get this company and we get that company, right? There's nothing like that. So what explains why the, the, the Google lawsuit is brought by the Department of Justice? which it was, as you mentioned, and, but the Facebook lawsuit at the federal level is brought by the Federal Trade Commission. There is a little bit of history to it, and the history is actually a history of the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission over the past decades becoming more cooperative as opposed to competitors in antitrust enforcement. And so they have informal understandings of which agencies cover 
which industries and which companies. In my earlier days as a telecom lawyer, before we called ourselves internet lawyers, the Department of Justice covered the telecom industry and the Federal Trade Commission covered the cable industry. Now it, both are internet companies, but there's a little bit of history as well as you know, sort of behind the scenes agreement. One of the statutes that's going to be important here is the so-called Hart Scott Redino Antitrust Improvement Act, which creates a procedure whereby big mergers have to be submitted to the government in advance. And that statute, in fact, says you have to submit your pre-clearance information to both the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission. And then the companies sort of wait to hear which agency is going to take the lead on any particular investigation. It's a really strange quirk of administrative governance, uh, but it is the case. We have two antitrust enforcers. Both of these uh, entities, uh, I'm saying entities rather than agencies, because we might quibble about whether the Department of Justice is rightly called an agency, are, exec- are within the executive branch, are they not, right? So, so you're basically dealing with two executive branch uh, institutions? They are, although the Federal Trade Commission is set up as an independent agency. And that was one of the things Congress did in 1914 to create an entity that was separate from or more separate from the president and the executive branch. And so with the progressive era and the New Deal sort of agencies, as you're very familiar with, the Federal Trade Commission is set up as an independent agency with five commissioners, three from one party and two from another party, to have some more independence from the Department of Justice and the executive branch generally. Right. And a brief digression into administrative law 101, which is at least of interest to the two of us. (laughs) There is, of course, that famous Supreme Court case from so many decades ago, Humphrey's executor, that made clear that, that Congress could impose limitations on removability at will of FTC commissioners. So with that in mind, let's let's uh, let's return to the Trump administration. Would it be accurate to say that the FTC as an agency has some practical independence from the White House in ways that the Department of Justice would not? Yes, it does. It does. Now, by long tradition and and law in many cases, the party that holds the presidency also holds a majority of the positions on an independent commission. So there are three Republican commissioners and two Democratic commissioners on the Federal Trade Commission, at least until we get into the Biden administration in January. But there is independence, and that independence came to the forefront relatively recently in the Qualcomm antitrust litigation, which was brought in California, where the Federal Trade Commission brought the case against Qualcomm. And there were certain points in the case where the Department of Justice appeared to take an opposite position from the Federal Trade Commission in the same litigation. An unusual circumstance where the where the U.S. government is saying different things from two different agencies, but it is something that can happen, and it is because of that independence of the Federal Trade Commission. And that case, I understand, has been resolved, right? So that case is at, at, at an end for now. Did, who, whose position prevailed as between the two that... Uh, the two uh, competing positions. I know they weren't completely competing all the time, but at least who 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 would be the who would get the trophy? Well, Qualcomm gets the trophy. Um, right. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Enough procedure. Uh, at least enough procedure for now. Let's let's look at what the complaint is about. What is the gravamen, as uh, as we lawyers say, of the complaint against uh, against Facebook? Uh, the gravamen of the complaint against Facebook is that they have monopolized the market for personal social network services. That's how it's described in the complaint. And there are three particular acts that the Federal Trade Commission identifies as contributing to that monopolization. The first of which is the 2012 Facebook acquisition of Instagram. The second is the 2014 Facebook acquisition of WhatsApp. And the third is a set of practices by which companies that do business on the Facebook platform through advertising, the development of apps for the Facebook platform, et cetera, agree that as a condition of having access to the Facebook platform, they will not develop services that are in competition with Facebook itself. And the complaint alleges that the combination of these actions by Facebook caused it to monopolize and to firm up its monopoly in the market for social network services. So the factual assumption there is that in the absence of acquisition, that either Instagram or WhatsApp or both would be competitors with Facebook? So both that they're in the same market and they would maybe rise up and have been competitive? Well, that's exactly right. The the theory of the complaint is that 
Instagram or WhatsApp or both of them, we're on a trajectory to become comp competing social networks to Facebook. And in fact, the complaint is littered with quotes from Mark Zuckerberg and other insiders at Facebook saying things like, Instagram is growing, Instagram is going to become a competitor to us, Instagram is going to be a threat to us, let's buy Instagram to head off that threat, or at least to give us more time to develop competing services. And similar quotations with respect to WhatsApp. It's a little hard in a vacuum to know what the context was for those quotations, but that is in fact the story that's told in the complaint. You mentioned two interesting dates, 2012, 2014. They both share this in common. They're quite a lot of time before 2020, right? In one case, eight years and another six years. And so the, 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 the federal government, not to mention the state governments, had every opportunity to challenge those mergers. You mentioned the preclearance requirement from the time of preclearance to now. Haven't they sort of been sitting on their hands for all this particular period of time? And, and ought that to matter? They have in the sense that uh, they did have the opportunity to challenge it. And just to, to give some more detail here, the HSR, the preclearance process, requires the companies to file notice that they intend to merge and then to wait and then to give the government information if the government asks for additional information, which it did uh, in these cases to a certain degree. And it gives the, uh, the, the government an opportunity to sue to block the merger before it ever happens. Um, and in both cases, the government did not. Um, does it put a deadline? I just want to jump in. Does it put a deadline on how long the government can wait before it brings its, its claim? And it is. It's just a 30-day deadline unless the government asks for information. What we call in the business issues a second request for information. Um, and it's called a second request because as you file initially to give the government notice uh, that you're planning a big merger, you have to provide a bunch of information right off the bat. But if the government files a request with the companies for more information, then that 30-day clock is told until such time as all the information comes comes in. And honestly, uh, and I practiced in this area for a while, companies want to cooperate with the government so that the government will clear the deal and not, not sue. So they often enter into agreements to toll the 30-day clock while the government thinks through the case and they try to convince the government that there really is no case, et cetera. But your fundamental point is exactly right. The government could have sued to block the Instagram merger in 2012. It could have sued to block the WhatsApp merger in 2014. It could have sued at any point since then to unwind the merger, which is what it's doing now in 2020. It is suing to unwind the merger. So one might have feared, and you, you mentioned it uh, when you were talking about the competition, one might have feared that Facebook bought up Instagram and WhatsApp in order to kill them, so-called killer acquisitions, right? We're going to we're gonna uh, deal with competition this way, buy them up and kill them. The buy and bury strategy, I think uh, it was mentioned. But they didn't do that, right? And, and, and so they continue to have these apps uh, up, until, uh, up until now. So uh, speculation, does that strengthen Facebook's, uh, Facebook's case? that they basically acquired these companies and they've continued to let them run? Or does it weaken Facebook's case? If you were the Federal Trade Commission, the story you would tell is this. Instagram and WhatsApp were developing functionality that was not yet inside Facebook, right? The picture pictures from your cell phone um, technology mm -hmm. of Instagram, the messaging technology of WhatsApp were technologies that were drawing customers away from the Facebook platform and therefore creating a new place in which customers sold their data to a social network for the, for the ability of that social network then to attract advertisers. But when Facebook acquires Instagram or acquires WhatsApp, even though they keep it separate, a separate service, a separate brand, et cetera, the data on the back end is now part of the Facebook enterprise, and there's not competition with Facebook in the same way. That's why one of the overall stories here, when you think about the Facebook customer, is really quite tricky because the Facebook customer isn't paying Facebook any money to use Facebook. Right. They're paying for the use of Facebook by giving the personal data that then Facebook can use to sell behavioral advertising. Interesting. So I, I guess we could look at it in two ways, but these are independent and supplement the government's argument is that this, the government would argue that this, uh, these mergers 
and their unfair practices damage consumers, right? The customers, as it were, but also advertisers. Is that is that sort of the, the essence of, of the complaint? The advertisers are worse off than they would be if there was an open uh, marketplace with these with these companies thriving. That that's exactly right. That's exactly right. With respect to consumers, the consumer harm argument that the government will put forward, and it's a consumer harm argument that they're going to put forward in the Google case as well, is that limited competition means that customers don't have choices among social networks based on those social networks' privacy policies, right? The only social network that they can pick is Facebook, and Facebook has extraordinarily, let's say, acquisitive privacy policies. They, they acquire the data of customers um, really quite completely. Whereas if there were competition, consumers might be able to choose a social network that has uh, better privacy policies, more pro-consumer privacy policies. On the other side of the market, the advertiser side of the market, it means that Facebook doesn't face as much competition in behavioral advertising because it's one of the only places with a significant amount of social network personal data. Okay, let's take a break and we'll come back to talk about the Facebook uh, litigation some more. Increase productivity and profitability through Acumas.com. Acumas provides cost-effective and reliable annuities management while keeping customer satisfaction at the helm of the action. With 40 years of excellence in the field of IP renewals, Acumas understands how quickly annuities can become burdensome for clients who would prefer their focus elsewhere. Contact info at acumas.com or visit acumas.com to discover how you can benefit from a management solution tailored to your needs. Trying to cut costs? You're not alone. In today's climate, a five-figure e-discovery bill per month is steep. Don't pay that. Use Logical to reduce expense and control your discovery process. Get started today for only $250 per matter and they'll waive migration costs from competing platforms. For more information, visit Logical.com slash LTN. That's Logic with a K, C-U-L-L dot com forward slash L-T-N. I'm back with uh, Professor Jim Spetta. We're talking about the Facebook litigation. So, Jim, you're, you might tell me that this is, is irrelevant, but let me throw it out there. Facebook competes the, the service and the industry it's in with WeChat, right, with this, with this uh, mega you know, Chinese uh, company in the, in the same marketplace, et cetera. Maybe this sounds like a, uh, a script written by Mark Zuckerberg, but, but, but bear with me. So they're, they're uh, acquiring companies and they're, and they're looking to become bigger and more powerful and all of that because they're looking to compete in, a, in a, an increasingly global marketplace in which uh, WeChat has enormous power by virtue of the Chinese economy, much less by way of uh, rules and restrictions, not to mention privacy, not to mention other kinds of issues. Does that matter for the uh, the antitrust claim and the unfair uh, practice claim that that Facebook is really looking to compete against this Chinese behemoth? I think it does matter. And I find one of the interesting issues in the case, the definition of the geographic market. To take half a step back, in order to prove the claim that they've reduced competition, one of the fundamental questions is reduced competition in what market? And the, the market then has to be defined in two ways. The first of which is the product market. What is the thing being sold or the service being sold? The second is the geographic market. And the government, the Federal Trade Commission in this case, defines the social networking market geographically as the United States. But Facebook is a worldwide phenomenon, as the complaint itself uh, says. There are more than 3 billion Facebook users around the world. And if you think about the global pl internet platforms, WeChat is the most similar platform to, to Facebook. Now, WeChat does a number of things Facebook doesn't do. It also behaves in some different ways. But it's also the case that unless you're a, a U.S. citizen who has a reason to be in communication with Chinese mainland or the Chinese diaspora around the world, you're not on WeChat, right? So there are not a lot of users who are moving back and forth between Facebook and WeChat, except for Chinese who are living in the United States. At least that's the data, data that I've seen. But you're right. The, one of the competitive stories that Facebook will tell is we needed to bulk up our functionality because we're in a worldwide battle. And when you look at the market for social networking platforms, you shouldn't just look 
at the United States. Well, let me ask a, a follow up to that. Do advertisers who look to advertise on Facebook decide between Facebook or WeChat? I imagine those are two very different markets markets uh, uh, as well, right? I mean, in support of the government's position, there yes, there may be two social media platforms, but they're on different planets in terms of accessibility and and uh, and negotiability among advertisers. Yeah, I think that's the key question. I don't have any insight into that data, although I'm sure that the lawyers and the economists who are working on these cases are going to be asking exactly that question. What is the substitutability that advertisers might see among those platforms. If my con- if what I've seen about the fact that consumers don't move between the platforms is more or less right, then advertisers probably don't move between Facebook and uh, WeChat in the same way. But your question reveals a more fundamental issue with respect to the advertising market, which is if it's the advertisers that we care about, maybe advertisers aren't choosing between Facebook and WeChat. But at least in the United States, they could choose between behavioral advertising services from Facebook and behavioral advertising services from Google, behavioral Mm -hmm. advertising services from Twitter, behavioral advertising services in some case from Amazon. There are a number of other big platforms that have access to substantial amounts of personal information that can provide targeted advertising services. Well, that's one of the ironies. I mean, I, you know, I don't work and dwell in this area, but when I think of, you know, sort of be careful what you wish for, if the government is successful in breaking up Facebook, right, in, in kind of unraveling this, this merger, it's not like the government has succeeded in breaking up big tech, right? And the great beneficiaries, just as you note, might be other big tech companies, no more so than Google and Amazon. And, uh, you know, who knows, maybe even Twitter. So that, that strikes me as, as one, of the, one of the perils of the, of the government strategy. Yeah, the one answer to that, of course, is to say, well, they got it right to sue Google. They got it right to sue Facebook. They should be suing Amazon. The European antitrust authorities often talk about the GAFA, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, as the platforms that are all anti-competitive. That is less a common description in the United States, but for the past few years, there has been increased attention to the platforms as a whole Is Amazon the next uh, antitrust case to be brought in the United States? I don't know the answer to that, but it is already the case that the European antitrust authorities have brought a case against Amazon following on cases that they've been bringing against Google and Facebook for some time. Interesting. This may be a question more germane to the Google lawsuit than the Facebook lawsuit. And that is with the arrival of the new administration, the Biden administration, which of course is going to announce an attorney general any day now, and, and a Department of Justice. Uh, the FTC, as you note, is more independent, and so it's more complicated in this respect. Is there the possibility the Biden administration will just bring this all to an end, say never mind, and, and, and withdraw the suit against Google, and then maybe maybe even look at the, uh, at the Facebook litigation? And, what, and how likely would that be? I think there's a possibility. My own view is that it's rather unlikely. Uh, and one of the reasons that I think it's unlikely Well, two reasons. The first of which is, if you think back to the Democratic primary, however long ago that was. Seems like a lifetime ago. (laughs) There were a number of candidates, Elizabeth Warren most prominently, but a number of other candidates who talked a lot about a reinvigoration of antitrust and talked specifically about the use of antitrust against the platforms um, and and in fairly aggressive aggressive strokes. Um, And I think that that wing of the Democratic Party is still around and it's going to put some pressure on the Biden administration. The second piece of evidence that I would point to is one of the reasons you have 40 states or 40 plus states, uh, state attorney generals, is the state attorney generals are showing us there's a bipartisan support for taking some action here. Interestingly, those on the progressive left and those on the right have a different set of complaints, usually about the practices of the platforms. But there's a fair group of people on both the left and the right who think, quote, something must be done, close quote. Um, about well, that's platforms. that's a real striking element of that. And let's let's shift a little bit from the feds to the to the states. And what what is the you mentioned the politics, the very interesting politics and maybe even the electoral politics that exists within the states. As a matter of law, though, what do the AG's complaints, if anything, add to the mix that's not provided by the FTC lawsuit? 
uh, nothing uh, as a matter of substance. Um, that is to say, the theories of anti-competitive action are very much the same. They're not 100% the same, but the theories of anti-competitive action are, are very much the same. The states have parents patriae authority, the, the, the parent of the people authority to bring cases under the federal antitrust laws. So I said before, there are two federal agencies. There are two federal agencies. There are all the state attorney generals. There's private litigation. The One of the features uh, or bugs, if you prefer, of our antitrust laws is that it has multiple possible enforcers and the states are enforcers of the federal antitrust law and they are also enforcers of their own state antitrust laws, although in most cases those state antitrust laws are very similar to the federal law. Are they very similar with respect to uh, damages and remedy? I recall that the, under the Sherman Act you get treble damages if you prevail. Is that Does that exist under state law such that there could be supplementary damages that could be enormous if Facebook were to lose this case, right? Absolutely. And in in fact, under state law, some forms of damages are available that are not available in uh, uh, under federal law. How big the total amount of damages could be is, is a story yet to be told, but it could be in the hundreds of billions of dollars or more. This is a bet the company case for Facebook, just as the Google case is a bet the company case for Google. So among Facebook's challenges, there's a, there's a fundamental, I don't know whether to call it a procedural challenge, but they have to negotiate against many, many parties, right? So if the FTC says, well, never mind, that doesn't, that doesn't end the AG lawsuit, right? And there's all these different attorneys general. We've seen that in the context of tobacco litigation, the opioid crisis. It's a big tent. So you're, you're tasked with negotiating this on behalf of Facebook. I'm thinking of a settlement. You basically have to get all the parties in the room to, to make everybody happy. Yes, that's exactly it. And in my experience, uh, both prior to this, as prior to becoming a, a professor as a practitioner, and more recently in just watching these cases, you will negotiate with everyone. You may break them into pieces, negotiate with the federal government first, and then a coalition of states. But you're never going to get 100% of all the private parties to agree to the same settlement. So this is the kind of case with enough parties and enough possible follow-on litigation that even if Facebook and and Google reach an agreement with the federal government, there's likely to be continuation. However, the presence of the federal government as a plaintiff in an antitrust case is something that carries a lot of weight with the court, right? It doesn't carry a lot of weight with the court as a formal evidentiary matter, right? There's no, this isn't administrative law. There's no presumption that the government's decision to bring a lawsuit is the correct decision. But nevertheless, the courts under, particularly the federal courts, understand the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission to be the most sophisticated litigants with the, with top economists and top technologists. And if they get out of the way, that is to say, they settle the case for relatively little change in behavior, the whole tenor of the state and private cases will change, and, and it'll become easier to settle if you're Google or Facebook. Interesting. So have you seen the film, A Few Good Men, right? It's, it's, uh, we, we, we tend to overquote it in all, all times. I'm thinking of the, uh, of the colonel on the witness stand. Colonel says, that as, as he's being cross-examined by Tom Cruise, you've just weakened a country today, Kathy. So I'm going to ask this question this way. So Facebook may have been responsible for these bad practices. Maybe uh, the the mergers were more than unwise. They raise anti-competitive effects. But ought we to be sympathetic to Facebook in this sense? The breakup of Facebook, the, the, the ultimate relief that's being called for, does truly portend the weakening of a tech company that has been of so enormous benefit from, demand for among, among the public, who will never have an access to WeChat or never have an access to any of the smaller companies, and that the result and the remedy may be an enormous setback for consumer consumer demand. Now, I know that's, I'm giving a, you know, sympathetic speech on behalf of, of Facebook, but I'm thinking about it from the vantage point of, you know, kind of the American citizenry. Is that, is that, is that a risk we run? Oh, that's absolutely a risk. I mean, the five biggest global companies right now in terms of market value are Google, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, and Apple, right? And they right. are the competitive success stories, the worldwide competitive success stories. You haven't actually asked me yet what I think of the litigation, but I think that's something very serious to worry about. It was a worry that was put forward in the Qualcomm case in a very similar manner. Qualcomm is one of the world's most important tech companies. 
Um, and the issue of whether antitrust remedies against Qualcomm would have limited its ability to compete on a worldwide stage against tech companies from other countries in particular was front and center. And I, th- I think those issues are quite present here. I think that the more you talk about the five platforms, the more you can see that there are competitive overlaps between those platforms. Do they do separate things? Sure. Certainly none of the companies delivers physical goods the way that Amazon does, and none of the companies delivers uh, video the way YouTube uh, in in Google does. But there there are very uh, strong similarities, um, and those similarities end up on the back end with respect to the relationships between consumers and their data. So I think this issue of overall competitiveness is both really important, important in evaluating whether the government should be suing, but also important in evaluating whether Facebook can really be described as just a social networking company that is standing independently from and in a completely separate market from these other platforms. Great. That's excellent. I, I, you know, just just by way of wrap up, if I could uh, pivot from that to the larger question, you touched on it when you mentioned Elizabeth Warren and, and, and others, we've got this raging conversation, right, about big tech and the role of big tech and whether it's the, the evil empire or or something else. And it's an interesting Venn diagram, right, as you noted in the context of the state AGs between sort of populists on the political, uh, so-called political right of the spectrum and very far on the left. So I want to ask you this, are, are, are we, in, in having this public discussion, you know, among our uh, sort of we the people, are we asking the right questions? Are we are we really asking the right questions about big tech and the role of big tech? Or are there some different questions that we're not asking that might lead us to uh, to more uh, uh, sense and common sense in, in dealing with these issues? Well, I think we do want to ask the question whether these platforms are engaged in certain kinds of anti-competitive practices. I am reluctant to conclude that what we should do is to break up the platforms. But there are some uh, contracting practices, these access uh, uh, restrictions that I referred to earlier, the third part of the Federal Trade Commission's case, could provide some grounds to open up the scope of competition. And I think that those sorts of remedies, which would stop short of breaking up the companies, are very important and and are part should be a more central part of the conversation. But the other piece of the conversation that these cases require and I think hasn't really come to the fore yet is the debate over privacy regulation, right? Okay. What we're talking about here is fundamental concerns about the use of consumer data and how it interacts with with behavioral advertising. And it seems to me a quite open question that even if the market were more competitive, would it actually be more protective of consumer privacy? I have my doubts. And I have my doubts largely because I don't think that it is possible for individual consumers to attend to privacy in the way that we think could be beneficial. And so what I predict is that as these cases go forward, the government and the parties will begin to talk in more serious regard about privacy regulation. And that would be a good conversation. And in fact, what we say in general is, if we can regulate the harm directly, let's regulate the harm directly if it's a privacy harm, instead of breaking up the companies through it through, through the way big hammer of antitrust law. Let me ask you one additional question. It actually harkens back to your mentioning of the uh, kind of the political uh, battle within the states that centers on maybe the role of big tech. And you mentioned also Elizabeth Warren before. I guess I want to ask the question this way. We focus in on what the remedy should be with respect to Facebook and the attempt to break up big tech and all of that. I'm wondering your thoughts about whether we're asking the question about the role of big tech and the role of law in protecting us from big tech or in enabling big tech to function in the right sort of way and how how we might ask uh, those questions in a way that would be ultimately more fruitful. Yes, I think there are two ways that I would approach this that I think are more productive than the question of breaking up big tech uh, writ large. And the first is to focus on what is the third part of the Federal Trade Commission case, the competitive practices that they have that restrict the ability of a new social network or a new competitor to come into the market. And those are the contractual restrictions that say, if you want to do business with Facebook, you can't do certain things that might down the line turn you into a competitor to Facebook. And so I would like to focus on those sort of 
walls around competition that the platforms build, as opposed to talking about breaking them up uh, writ large. But the second, and I think even more important conversation is a conversation around privacy regulation. One of the fundamental assumptions of the government's case is that consumers are being injured by the way their data is being used and that it would be better if consumers had a competitive market and could therefore choose how their data was going to be used. But I don't have the same confidence in the markets being able to solve the harms that arise from the use of consumer data. In fact, I think it is like more like health and safety regulation than it is like market regulation. And so in those circumstances, I'd like us to have a really serious discussion about what sorts of privacy regulations we should put on the use of consumer data. And in fact, my prediction is, as these cases go on, the government and the companies will have that conversation, and that may be where the settlement for the antitrust right, uh, cases actually comes, agreements about how to treat consumer data. And I take it that even out of those agreements that may, may come from settlement or relief, those conversations need also to happen in Congress, right, within the White House and within administrative agencies, just to be able to tackle these issues in ways that, however Herculean the efforts of courts and lawyers, need more folks at the table. Absolutely. And Congress is really the key piece in this puzzle. For almost a decade, the Federal Trade Commission has been publishing reports, holding workshops, giving testimony in Congress and saying to Congress, we really need you to bite down on the question of privacy regulation in the internet and more particularly in the large platforms. And there hasn't been that movement in Congress. I don't know whether to be optimistic or pessimistic that Congress will come to the table, but they're the key actor right now. Well, thanks so much, Jim. It looks like we've reached the end of our time for this episode. I want to thank Dean Jim Spetta for joining us today. If our, if our listeners have questions or wish to follow up with you, how can they reach you? Uh, they can find my email on the Northwestern uh, website, james.spetta at northwestern.edu. His professional life is an open book. <laughs> And uh, I want to thank our listeners for tuning in. If you like what you heard, please rate and review us in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcasting app. I'm Dan Rodriguez signing off for Law Technology Now. Until next time, thank you for listening. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via iTunes and RSS. Find us on Twitter and Facebook. Or download our free Legal Talk Network app in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.